Well, as I said, we're talking about social media for writers and creators. But before we dive into that topic, let's let our wonderful panelists introduce themselves, starting down on that end. I thought I had like a short moment to like collect myself. <clears throat> I'm M.D. Cooper. I write military science fiction. Um, I also have a, a gardening persona of all things um, that's closing in on like 80,000 followers on social media. So I'm pretty stoked about that. And I've written about 100 novels, and I do a lot of work to promote those on all sorts of social media platforms, and um, it's kind of my bread and butter most of the time. Okay. I'm Tyra Burton. I'm a professor at Kennesaw State University, where I teach digital and social media marketing. And I have a book called Socially Engaged that I wrote with Jana Oliver a few years ago, and hopefully a new one called Socially Evergreen, if my evergreen self can ever get it done this year, which is the job. So we'll hope. <laughs> Well, I'm uh, Troy Faison. I've published seven graphic novels, usually sci-fi, fantasy, uh, maybe a little bit of horror, and I'm published through uh, Kindle Publishing. And I also have free giveaways afterwards. I have a couple of graphic novels I'll sign and give out, some cards, and uh, we'll have some fun. I am Jim Nettles. I am a science fiction, fantasy, horror, bit of this, that, and the other author. I'm also a nonfiction author writing about data security, privacy, social media, the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, I also have a workshops company where we teach creatives how to actually do business and all that kind of fun stuff. And I am the technical director for the Continual Online Virtual Convention. And I'm Gail Z. Martin and Morgan Bryce. As Gail, I write epic and urban fantasy and a few other sub-genres. Sub As Morgan, I write urban fantasy, male, male, paranormal romance. I am the founder and one of the con runners for Continual, the online ongoing multi-genre convention that never ends. Uh, I My MBA was in both marketing and systems analysis, so I got in early on the computer side of marketing. And by the way, I'm part of the Zombies Needs Brains Kickstarter, so if you're interested in bringing four new anthologies to life, come on up, scan the QR code afterwards, it'll take you right to the backer page. So, there's a lot of choices when it comes to social media, and not everybody's on every platform, both creators and your target audience. How do you decide where to go to find the people that you want to reach? And once again, I'll start down at the far end. What, what, did, what did I do? <laughs> Baptism um, by fire. So I think one of the things to think about when, you, when you're trying to decide where you want to put your effort is it needs to be a platform you enjoy using if you hate it, you're not really going to have a good time engaging there. You're not going to use it like a user. And to really market well on any social media platform, you need to be a user of that platform. Understand how people use it, how understand where they congregate, how they operate. Um, and, then, and then you also decide what your goals are. Like a platform like Facebook is good for reaching, unless you want to pay for Facebook ads, which is also an option. It's good for reaching people you know and perhaps their friends. Whereas platforms like Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok are all platforms where your content can be viewed by all of humanity um, should it become that popular. So that depends a lot on what you want to do. And then a lot on whether or not, like you write YA, like maybe TikTok's not safe, or Twitter's not safe and you might want to steer away from there. You know, so there's little nuances for different platforms that you might want to consider. So I'm gonna say wherever your target market is, so wherever your readers are congregating, hopefully it's a platform, because I absolutely agree, it's a platform that you enjoy creating content for, because if you don't, absolutely like she said you're not going to but look to see where your readers are because that's who you're trying to connect with so to me that's the most important part yeah and, and you know for me it's all about out you know your outreach of your product and sometimes I'll go on a platform I'll research it and kind of see okay what kind of uh, focus is going on with this in particular platform you know some might be more focused on kind of like a family type thing community type thing another one might be more about art so you just kind of go initially with just what you feel in your gut. And as you go forward with it, you'll be able to dissect as you go that, yeah, this one's just, no, but yeah, this one. So it's just learning by doing. So I'm going to, and I'm going to throw the fun words out there, demographics. You need mm -hmm. to know two sets of demographics. Yeah. Number one, who are you trying to reach and why? And then number two, what platform are those people on? And again, if it's a platform you don't like, don't enjoy, then you don't have to do it. You can't do all the things. Even if you wanted to, you can't do all the things and do anything else. 
Um, now there are tools that can help you, but I mean, the, the main thing we do see now is video. And, um, the other thing I'll add to this is knowing what kind of content you want to create because it needs to be about you to engage people and build a relationship with them, not just buy my books. Yeah, I'll definitely agree uh, and, and hopefully add a little bit to what's been said. Um, if you don't enjoy what you're doing or it, um, it frightens you, it upsets you, you're uncomfortable with it, you're not going to do it. So you either need to hire somebody to do it for you or decide to be on a different platform. There are learning curves and it's, you can learn to do things, but again, that takes time. And you have to decide if you think there's enough potential benefit to a platform to warrant not doing the other things you were not doing when you're learning how to use that platform. Um, and looking at who's on the platform and how are they using it so that when you do get on the platform, you fit in in terms of the kinds of things being shared instead of being the, oh, that's a person who thought they needed to be on TikTok and doesn't really know what TikTok's about. You don't want to be that person. So you want to know enough about how a platform works and what users on the platform expect so that uh, you fit in in all the right ways. Now, how did you learn about, pick one of the social platforms that you're on and let us know, how did you first get involved there and how did you learn how to make it work for you. I'll, I'll start this way. I won't always pick on you down at the end, they're honest. I'm going to pick on Jim first. Oh, pick on Jim. thanks. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> um, so I do things a little bit differently because I tend to, because uh, I often will write about different platforms. And again, because I'm evil, I write about both how evil all of them are, <laughs> and they're just there to scoop your data up, and also about how to then leverage that to your benefit. Um, but I am, you know, I have a hate-hate relationship with most social media, so I'm just disclosing that because I'll make a few snarky comments along the way. Those that know me will not be surprised. Um, but again, like most people, we I started on Facebook. I have a Facebook account because my wife created it and said, you have to be on. And I looked at it and I sort of grumbled. Um, but looking at it as a tool and a technology, it's all about playing with it, experimenting with it, but not allowing it to be a time suck. And that's the hard part. But there's, you're fortunate now in that there are a ton of platforms to find the thing that works for you. And there's a ton of things, you know, there's a ton of ways to learn about them. And the easiest way to learn about a platform is go to their website and read because Facebook tells you how we want you to use our platform. And same thing for Instagram, it's all meta. Twitter tells you if you go digging right, We'll tell you how to use our platform. Uh, you know, if so, if you look at the terms and conditions, they will tell you how to optimally use it for your benefit. Okay. Try. What was the question again? <laughs> I don't know. How do you get? What was the? Pick a platform that you're on and talk about how you taught yourself or learned oh, okay. how to use it yes. to your benefit. Well. Um, I think my favorite one right now is TikTok, um, and what was interesting about that is um, you had like the short reels, and a lot of people are kind of copying that idea with other platforms. They're seeing that short reels really help. It's amazing to me how I think with my stuff, I found that you know when you're dealing with like visual arts with stories, people they don't want to give much time because they're scrolling a lot, they're moving a lot, so you have to create. A reel, which, you know, short video, I tried that. That was a huge hit because when I would try to do a video on another platform that was longer, like 10, 15 minutes, wouldn't have that much reaction because people like the reels. I like something fast. So for me, fast music, fast images just exploded the interest. So I started focusing on the TikTok. And a good way to help to get people interested in you and probably following you is say you start on there, you don't have a lot of followers, you want to get more. Uh, and someone makes a comment for some reason. Go on their page, make a comment back, a like back to one of their videos. And I found a lot of the times that if you show interest in them, they will tend to choose to follow you without you first following them. And I think we should, you know, usually follow people back 
so I chose TikTok as my canon of reaching people. It's worked out really good, but I engage it every day. I do uh, Facebook with a fan page on that, but I think for me, TikTok worked really good with uh, my art, my images. So that's what I'm doing, and we'll talk more about it as mm -hmm. we go. So, Tyra? I'm an Instagram lover. I A couple of years ago, I decided that that was going to be the platform that I learned about, so I spent a year really... Um, investing myself in the community, seeing what other people were doing in the industry, and also seeing what made things pop. And it really was a chance for me to understand how important hashtags were on Instagram. And it was my dog, because plus pets, they are the best thing ever for in engagement. And I have a little min pin, and I would tag him dogs of Instagram and so forth. And then one day I tagged him min pin, min pin Instagram, and little dude shot right up because there was a men pen community that was very interested in seeing my cute little dude. And it really taught me the importance of niche marketing some of those hashtags and burrowing down, burrowing down into what uh, smaller audiences to really be able to broaden that reach, which doesn't make a bit of sense, but it does when you use hashtags. So I've loved exploring it and seeing what visually I can get people to respond to, what I can put, how long a caption can be, and I play with that. I do a lot of A-B testing, where you'll like take one thing and change it and see how that impacts engagement. And for me, Instagram's been the place to do that. And I also wanna say that Jim said is very, very true. Every single platform will have a business uh, blog. They'll have a place where you can go and do classes. Facebook has more online little short classes for you to take than I think any platform. Twitter has a whole set of them, and I believe Instagram does as well, but they're easy to find and they will teach you what they want you to do to be successful, which doesn't mean it always works, but it's a good starting place. So I've been on almost all of the social media platforms since each one of them started. I was like one of the top ten, first 10,000 people to be on Twitter, and then I like didn't use it properly for years. but. Um, but I, I, I did it actually out of spite almost because I was a software engineer and I had to understand how these things work to do integrations with them. I hated it. But slowly over time, I actually really came to like social media to the point where I probably liked it too much. And I've, I've kind of found a happy medium, which is good. But the platform that I really like the most right now, uh, it's like Troy does, is, is TikTok. Um, I can reach a lot of people on TikTok very easily. Um, Except for the video does take a bit, but the reels don't take too long to make. And of course, I can reuse those reels on um, on Instagram and YouTube. And um, I also like do well enough on TikTok. TikTok now that TikTok pays me for my views, so I make about fifty to seven to hundred dollars a day just straight off the number of views that I get on some of my videos. Um, and I'm really excited about that. And I, I had this really roundabout plan. I want to write post-apocalyptic novels. I, everything I write now is military science fiction or space opera. So I created a post-apocalyptic character. She's a post-apocalyptic gardener named uh, Blueberry Sage. And she wears head-to-toe latex and a gas mask in gardens. And let me tell you, it's excruciating. But um, especially in the summertime, I like lose five to 10 pounds every time I do a shoot. But so I'm like just guzzling like electrolyte water and Gatorade afterwards. But so it does, so like, like, um, like Jim said, it takes a lot of time because I spend an entire day shooting and then I have to edit and make all the videos and whatnot. But um, I've really enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed sort of getting to make this community. And I like the interactive tech part. This character is actually because of sentences talk, which is really cool. On Instagram, it's just all hearts and stuff like that. And because of the content I do, it's, it's a lot of, you know, various emojis. It's, you know, Easter. Um, but, um, you know, Instagram, Twitter is actually really good too because I got into the queer community on Twitter beforehand and I completely changed my profile. So suddenly I had, I had this, like, I started like a thousand followers and that was really handy. But, um, but yeah, I actually really like the people on TikTok. And just today, I finally started, after doing some other light promotion of my other work, Blueberry Sage has just started to warm up her audience for doing Kickstarter. And I'm hoping to probably do like $50,000 in a Kickstarter for that too. So it'll be fun times. Yeah. And I do want to add a little, just a little bit on TikTok because right now it is the highest traffic platform. There is an expectation because originally it was, hey, it's for the kids going out and doing whatever the stuff. Now, you know, there's all those, all, you know, the old people are out there too. I mean, we, we're taking stuff over. Um, there goes the neighborhood. We the, did it to Facebook and now it's TikTok. Yeah, grandma's on TikTok and making videos. Um, but the good news is we're getting to save people's recipes. And but the important thing is to know how TikTok works is especially when you're getting started they want you to grow they want you to produce 
So the first thing that happens is when they drop a video, they show it to 250 people using an algorithm that says, based on you, your interests and profiles and data they already have, when you sign up, um, they show that video to 250 people. There's some regionalization and other stuff that goes on. Then depending on who reacts to that video, they show it to another 250. If they get positive hits and people watching for a certain amount of time, then they start showing it more and more. And they created the algorithm to become viral, either to get you in front of people or to make sure that no one ever sees you again. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's so much discussion about um, when you post and how often you post and does it need to be at the same time on the same day if you're not posting as frequently. Well, hold that thought because we're going to come back to that. We're going to come back to the nitty gritty, how the how it all works behind the scenes. Um, I, I want to uh, spread word off of something Tyra said about her, her dog because if you, if you go out there on any of the social platforms and your message is, buy my book, that gets really old really fast. Like, after once um, <laughs> and not only will people stop following you but the the system won't be showing you around either so you've got to come up with reasons to be interesting well what are you into maybe it's a pet maybe it's cooking maybe it's dancing maybe it's music um, you know me personally if you couldn't guess if you don't know anything about me I'm a huge supernatural fan so of course I'm gonna post stuff about my favorite show and by the way, if you like the vibes from that show, you're probably going to like what I write because it's all about supernatural stuff, the occult, monsters, ghosts, ghost hunters, vampires, you know, there, there's some commonality there. And so what I find is that putting up some fan videos about supernatural draws the right kind of people to follow me because we have something in common. And then I'll throw up, you know, maybe once every 10 videos or something, a book video and say, hey, you know, if you like that, you'll probably like this. And that I think is much more authentic because it's coming up the way in conversation, hopefully that you would have one-on-one -on -one with someone to say, we like all this stuff in common, have you tried this? As opposed to I'm chasing you down the street, waving my book at you, trying to get you to buy it. So go for the commonality and, and hinge on something that you love and that is comfortable for you, but that also makes a natural tie-in to bring somebody back to whatever it is you create. Now, before we get into some of those nitty gritty details, like Tyra said, and I do want to come back to that because it's really important. It can be very easy to get caught up in, oh, I've got this many views and oh, I've, you know, I've got this many followers. And, and now all of a sudden, instead of trying to promote what you create, now you're chasing becoming an influencer. And they're kind of two different things because while you need to gather an audience to expose people to whether your book or art or music or whatever it is, just getting those people is not an end in itself. So how do you, how do you gather that following without getting lost in the process of um, getting lost along the way. Jim? Um, I, again, for me, I share the stuff that interests me. I share the stuff about me. I don't share a lot of personal stuff. Pretty much if you're following me, here's what you're going to see. You're going to see continual. You're going to see a lot of video of me running my mouth and, and doing the things that I do. You're going to see stuff about Scottish heavy athletics and me running around in a kilt. Also, generally, doing things that should put me on a Darwin Award nominee list. Um, you know, you see things about, you know, traveling around, getting to do conventions, getting to do fun stuff. That's the stuff I share. Um, because other than that, do you want to really watch a writer going? But occasionally I also, if I'm down working in the shop, playing with glass, I do things that say this is who I am. Because my approach and my thought on it is, Social media is there for us to build a relationship. And if you like who I am and you get an idea of who I am, and you know, then you, yeah, you might buy some books and let me get in your head because if you're reading my stuff, then you're letting me influence how you think. Even if you're reading just my snarky urban fantasy, you're reading some horror, you're reading articles and stuff I do, um, it's, it's much more about here's who I am and what I'm doing, and this is the you're letting come and play. 
Mm-hmm. Sure. I always hate it when I see people post just things that are kind of plain, like some funny joke they saw on someone else's page and they put it on theirs and so on and so on. And the bad thing about that is I can see that anywhere. We all have something unique to share and on these platforms we're supposed to show people our life. And your life is different. No one in this room has the same life, same experience, same feelings and emotions. So don't waste it with just copycat stuff. Share who you are. And I believe we're all interesting. And when you do that, that will draw people to what you do. Because you'll be giving them something that no one else can give them, which is you and how you really feel about things. And through that, you can show them your art, your projects. But you have to start with that because people can feel when something's fake. Be, be real. Be real with people. And don't be afraid to be real. And you'll get some people that will freak out about it because they're not used to that. But do it. I, I'm going to echo authenticity. So as creators, we are our brands. And so people want to know who we are. But I also think, kind of in line with Jim, you need to figure out what your boundaries are. So if you have a partner or a spouse, are they going to be included with that authentic self that you put out there? If you have children, how are you going to refer to them? Are you going to refer to them? And think about those boundaries before you start because they're hard to go back and get. Um, I'm lucky that my husband didn't mind that I never asked him if he minded I talked about him. So that worked out well for me. But I think that being authentic and showing your creative process and who you are helps you emotionally connect with people. And that's the emotional connection we look for on social media because the first word is social. And that means we're engaging and trying to find those emotional connections. So I post a lot of cat and dog pictures because we don't have kids. We have four fur babies. So every, I just, just like looking at my feed going, what do I post about? So by the way, Star Wars, uh, fur babies, and my hubby. And so that's how I'm portraying my authentic self, that and coffee. That is the power of Star Wars. You mm -hmm. said Star Wars and three people woke up. I know. I just it's power, it. isn't it? Let me tell you, later my new print is going to be posted on my Instagram. I'm very so I think everybody said almost everything I was going to say, so I'll just make something up. No, um, the, the thing that I think, um, the two things that come on to really stress is that you are building your brand and your brand is you um, as a creator, unless you're doing it on behalf of some sort of corporation or you're working with a group of authors or creators to build something bigger. Your brand is you. It's your name, and that's what you want people to remember when they see your book, when they see you know you on an art show um, or anything like that. Um, and they want to remember you, and you have to remember that. The other thing is that the the thing that it used to be called, um, and this is what tick, or what Instagram was really known for, is called curated perfection. Mm -hmm. Curated perfection is where it looks like your life is always perfect, your house is always clean, your kids are always behaved, you know, all that stuff. And that doesn't work anymore. In fact, it has a negative impact now. People don't believe in curated perfection, and they will not follow you if that's all they see in your content. They want to see you screwing up. They want to see your house being dirty, just like theirs, you know. They want to see your kids being annoying or whatever you decide to put on there. So I would, this is something I would strongly recommend is that you don't create this whitewash, pristine persona, but you make sure that you are a real person. Yeah, and I think it's important to keep your eye on the prize. Some people are on TikTok and Instagram and, and other sites because they want to be an influencer. They want to get the tens of thousands, maybe millions of followers. They want to be a brand uh, endorser. They want to get free stuff in the mail so from, from companies so that they can uh, talk about it. They want to be internet famous. Um, if you're out there promoting your book or your music or your art, your real goal is to draw people to you who want to eventually get to know you and buy your books, music, and art, not just be an influencer. And it can get so easy to get tied up in, in this, oh, I, I racked up, you know, a hundred more likes or a thousand more likes. And at some point you have to look at the sales numbers and go, are they translating? Can I see any connection between I had a great week on TikTok and, oh look, my sales are up a little bit. You're never going to be able to, to really draw that line completely, but you should start to get a feel if, if everybody loves your dog pictures and nobody comments or, or hearts your book pictures, 
maybe you're not selling books, you're selling dogs. And um, so that's something to keep an eye on because it's so easy to get caught in the competition of, you know, a hundred more likes, a thousand more likes, and that's, that's not really the name of the game. Also, it's hard with dog pictures. My dogs are 10 years old and they sleep. So I've already posted pictures of them sleeping on the left side, sleeping on the right side, sleeping upside down. Wash, rinse, and repeat. So those of you with younger dogs or energetic dogs or photogenic dogs, you, you've really got something valuable there. I'm 16 and a half with amazing ears. Or a really, really ugly dog. Yeah. <laughs> this is true. Or a super cute dog, yeah. So I want to come back to what Tyra um, brought up, which is that all hours of the day, all uh, days of the week, um, are not equivalent for every audience. How do you figure out when to schedule your posts, and you can schedule them, they don't all have to be done live, so that you not only reach the audience you want to reach, but you're getting the activity at a time that the platform registers so that it does you the most good. Jim? Experiment. Um, you can actually find a fair amount of demographic data that will tell you, again, this goes back to demographics and the boring stuff, and everybody's like, well, that's a lot of work. Well, if you spent weeks, months, years working on a book, and now there it's like, well, it's a lot of, a lot of time to reach people. Well, if you want to reach people, you got to know when you can reach them and how they can connect with you. And so there's a lot of experimentation. Um, and that's it, the kind of the short version of it. Um, but the other thing is just kind of consistency because once people know to try to follow you and see what's happening, what's going on, um, you know, that's kind of the other thing is often it's not simply the eggs on every Tuesday at 8, 19, a.m. while you know people are just getting to the office and you're doing this and you're doing this and you're doing this that is the ideal time well that can be true for things like emails but with your social media platforms you don't also necessarily have control over when it actually posts or when people actually will see them regardless of what what time and when you actually posted them so that's kind of one of those things that's a little bit of a crapshoot. that's definitely I was going to ask, why does he get eyes? See, see look at this. You're, you're the only one that gets little eyeballs. And look, Everybody I have no eyes. Eye. Do you have eyeballs on I you? I noticed that too. I'm jealous. You are all, you're all seen. That's what it is. No, they're all watching to make sure when I ne the next time I do something stupid. They're ready. <laughs> no, uh, so, I'm just joking. You're, you're giving me eyeballs? <laughs> i got eyeballs. Has that, now has you ever, see, if has you everybody want, seen yeah, the yeah, eyes yeah. on no. the lions in front of the Marriott? I, I mean, genius. Two, so, uh, and I'll I posted find it on social media. A anyway, seriously, seriously. What I just did, what did I do? I got attention, didn't I? I did something. Look at you. I said something. I'm brilliant. Um, <laughs> you are. But, you know... In life, when you're going about marketing, your eyes should be able to pick up and see little things like, you know, you're the only one that has little eyes until then. And in social media, you can pick up on these little little things that maybe some people don't see, but they will eventually. So the minute you get an idea in marketing, do it immediately, because trust me, an hour or two or a day later, somebody else will get the same idea, then they'll be doing it. So the minute you get an idea, you do it. Uh, I know for me, sometimes I get crazy ideas. I wake up with a crazy idea. How many people have woke up and you had a dream or something like, that's a good story? You and, have time to sleep? A little bit. <laughs> I'm not a vampire, so a little bit. <laughs> I'm joking. No, seriously, I have a little bit of time to sleep. But what I'm saying is that take a little notebook pad or something, put it next to your bed with a pencil. Because you'll find when you have these ideas in social media, what happens usually? You forget it, don't you? You didn't write it down. You kind of knew something. Write it down immediately and keep those ideas and start using them. And that's what we can stretch out. That's what we can do. So be creative with your social media outreach. You know, get outside that box and uh, complain about not getting eyeballs. <laughs> I'm old and blind. I, you know, <laughs> he needs help. <laughs> So um, I'm going to tell you also to watch for what's trending and also what 
each platform is pushing. So whatever is important to that platform, if they've released a new feature, that's going to be what they want you to do. So I'm doing digital um, stuff for one of the tracks here, and it had been dormant up until Dragon Con when I took it over. And I was like, okay, so how can I get people to know we're here? So World Beard Day happened yesterday. For all those of you that have beards, you missed your day. It was yesterday. But I put together a reel for it and dropped it. And we've gotten more views off of that than we have anything else organically because reels are being pushed by um, Facebook and Instagram. So I dropped it in Meta Studio. Um, it's on Instagram. They asked, do you want it to be on Facebook? I'm like, absolutely. And so now it's showing on both. I'm still getting uptick the day after. I've gotten another probably 100% more views today. And because I knew reels were something that they were interested in people seeing. So pay attention to what content that um, the platform itself wants you to produce. And I don't even know if that was the question. So speaking, this well, is speaking like, of, of not remembering uh, things, I wrote down the question, so I remember oh, when I got so here. I was going to say, this is like social media. Somebody said something, and then yeah. everybody went rambling. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, so the one thing is, um, make your, have your dog reading books. I just thought of it, you're talking about, like, everybody's watching your dog, and, like, have the dog reading the books. you got to, like, think of the, thinking outside the yeah, box there. Yeah, there you go. Um, like, read the bandit, put him to sleep. So a lot of the question was, the, the question was, like, how do you know when to post? How do you know, you know, how oh, to engage okay. your platform? And right. um, do that. One of the great things is the platform. Um, TikTok, you can actually go to your analytics. Ironically, with TikTok, they have better analytics on the web than they do on the app. And you can actually see when your users are most active. Um, and you, that will help you know when to when to post. It'll show you when your user is most active on your post, when you're most likely to comment. You can really dig down into a decent amount of information on there. Um, Instagram will do the same. If you have a creator account, you get more information. If you have a professional account, you get even more information. But if you have a professional account, you kind of like limit your reach because they realize you're a professional. They want you to pay. Um, but you can find out as well, like who you're reaching. Is your reach upticking? Is it going down or not? Um, and that's some, some great information to use. They, they'll also let you can tell you, like, are they men, are they women, how old are they, stuff like that. So you can learn a lot about the audience that you have. I do think, though, that, like, every, no matter what you make, there are 10,000 people, bare minimum, on any platform who do what you do. And as an author, if I have 10,000 people who will read my books, like every one of my books, I can make a million dollars a year. Because uh, that's that's how, how much money they'll, they'll pay for books. If you can actually make a full-time living off of 10,000 people who follow your work. And there are 10,000 people on every platform who like what you do. Um, and you know, Facebook has 2.9 billion, YouTube has 2.5 billion, uh, TikTok's right around 1 billion people. So you can imagine in those masses of people, the people, the people who like what you want are there. Um, and it's just a matter of finding, like by using the, the hashtags, like Tyra said, and sort of like trying to figure out to niche down where they are. And look at what they're doing. Um, and look at, and you can also look at trends in what they're doing. Like, say, for example, you write urban fantasy, maybe you write PF, PWF, um, some, some paranormal or something like that. I mean, one of your characters does has tarot cards. Get in the tarot community, tag, tag tarot, you know, stuff like that, and get get those people that way. So think about what else your people do, and you can use those demographics to start there. Um, yes, you shouldn't be chasing. You shouldn't be chasing views for views' sake. However, uh, YouTube. TikTok and Instagram will all pay you for reels now. Um, TikTok, TikTok will let, will start doing it once you hit ten thousand. YouTube and Instagram are still invite only, but um, but I know people who actually make their living now just on the money that they're paid by those three platforms for those things. So, you know, if you if you spot an opportunity and you think like, wow, I could actually make like a, a decent side hustle making videos, you know, you might want to think about that too. Because I'm sure lots of you cre are creating more than just books and whatnot, so it might dovetail with what you have going on. I just love how positive you are that there are 10,000 people out there that will like. Absolutely. I, think I believe that. Because we always talk about how hard it is to find people. I think that's a really positive spin on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and I want to also say you don't have to find those 10,000 people on the same. Yeah. They don't all have to be on the same platform. You can have, you know, 500 on one platform and 1,000 on another platform and 2,000 on another platform. And it can add up to that because your readers are not all on every platform. They're picking and choosing the ones they enjoy interacting with, which is why it, if you can manage it and keep up with it, it's important to be on several platforms uh, because your readers are spread out out there. They're, they're not going to be just in one place. What uh, tools, give me your favorite two tools that you use to help you do uh, your social media? Jim? 
Um, great, I get to go again. You do. First. You do. <laughs> um, I need to pick on you. I'm, it's I'm all out the of eyeballs. Practice. It's the eyeballs. They're watching. Um, so the the number one tool I use a lot of right now because we use it as a scheduling tool for video and it allows us to emulate being live um, is called. Um, <laughs> Priceless. It's been a long weekend. <laughs> um, it's one stream dot live. Um, it's very similar to Restream, um, and I've used Restream as well. Uh, but one stream works very well um, to go and carry and broadcast video, and you can stream video to multiple channels at the same time. Um, because we do a lot of a lot of panel work, we do a lot of long form video type stuff. That works really well. Um, then, you know, I, everybody's familiar with Hootsuite. Um, I've got Social Bee, a couple of other tools that, and right now I'm mainly using Social Bee as the kind of the version of Hootsuite to do stuff. Um, I've got a couple of other tools that we go in and use because if you, I, I have to batch my life. Everything is about batching and going through and doing stuff. Sometimes it is putting it together for, a day, a week, whatever. But that's the two biggest tools I'm using right now. Okay. Troy? I would say music is very powerful. I can load up a video. It's an interesting video. And the song that I put with it can really, and sometimes I'm just amazed, can really make all the difference in the world. And it's like, it's pretty smart how they do it. You know, you pick a song and that artist would get a little bit of money kickback because you use their song on the platform. I think that's a part of a really smart way how they do that. But seriously, really think about a song that you like. Don't pick what's popular because then you're not being genuine as to what you like and then delivering what you uh, present to people. So music's very powerful, and it sounds very simple, but s special effects for your videos. Sometimes when you have a video of yourself talking about a topic or something and it's just a video image, visually it can get just boring after a while but sometimes a little haze a little blur focus a little 3d haze can keep people from toning out because they're like oh something else is happening and you can use that as a tool so what you do is you watch your video and you know that you know 30 seconds or whatever 15 seconds of a video you know that little spot where it gets kind of boring don't you you're kind of like it's kind of going that's where you put in that effect that little pop and you keep that so I use that a lot. Music, special effects. It's very simple, but it works. Try, try to top that. Um, I will tell you what I love. I can I'm top joking. that. Um, you can. Canva. Who uses mm -hmm. Canva? Canva is my jam. I love it. It has been my saving grace. It amazes me what I can do in there, and I keep finding new things all the time. I do wish it had a better organizational system for my stuff. That part makes me cry. But it is, by and large easy to use, has a depth that you can get into and start doing changes and um, have a lot of fun with it. So definitely Canva. My other one is going to be StreamYard. I've used StreamYard now to yeah. do my classes with and That's you cool. can... Hmm? Yeah, StreamYard works. Yeah. It'll broadcast to multiple channels at the same time. The other thing I like about it is I do podcast and so I will meet my guest in StreamYard. We can broadcast live or I can just record it and it will record both of us separately. So I can have two separate audio tracks instead of just one uh, to play with in GarageBand. Not that I said a third thing. <laughs> so I, um, I think probably my favorite tool I'm using right now is Adobe Premiere Pro. I used a lot of different video editing software and I just always kept running into things that it couldn't do. And you think, you think oh God, Adobe, Adobe Premiere Pro must be complicated. I actually also think it's like one of the simplest video editing programs out there. So that's like my number one program right now. Cause I actually make, um, I'm making gardening videos, right? So I'm like, it's like me in the dirt, you know, um, with wearing a corset, trying not to kill myself while I'm planting potatoes or something stupid like that. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm, I'm doing, I do a lot of heavy editing. Um, to put all my videos together and it works great for that. Uh, the other thing that I've used a lot in the past that I'm not doing right now, I used to live stream my writing. So when I was actually writing a novel, it would be up on the screen and you could see the book as I was writing it. And I would get a lot of people that would watch while I would do that. And um, I streamed that to a whole lot of different locations simultaneously. And I also want to have like all the custom stuff on the screen. And so I use Streamlabs OBS, which can stream to anything, but you also need like a degree in streaming to like 
function use that software. So if you really, if you keep banging into limitations with the software you're using, and you're like, well, I wish I could do this, I wish I could move the chat over here, I wish I could have like a special effect in the middle of streaming, then that's the platform you need to, the software you start looking at is Streamlabs OBS, and you probably need a second computer to uh, to run it while you're doing something else. Um, and one other note here, what was it? Oh well, it's gone. <laughs> I'm going to second what's up, what Tyra said about Canva. I absolutely mm -hmm. love Canva. It's kind of like the poor man's um, Adobe, mm -hmm. and it isn't as complex uh, to figure out as Adobe. Uh, I, I very quickly upped for the pro level because I needed more photos, I needed more music, I needed more everything. But I put book videos together in Canva, and with a little practice, you get pretty fast at that, and then I upload them on YouTube and TikTok and Instagram and Facebook with reformatting that I can do in Canva. And that's a lot of fun. It's also a different way to present uh, the book. Um, and then I, I, uh, I do a lot of Zoom interviews for Continual, uh, probably three to five every week. So um, I'm on Zoom quite a bit for that, but then I do the editing in iMovie. And it's uh, pretty intuitive compared to some of the options. I'm sure there are more powerful programs out there with a lot more bells and whistles if you're doing something way more complicated than what I'm doing. But for what I'm trying to do, I can put out a nice video in a reasonable period of time that looks reasonably professional. And in addition to the Zoom interviews that I do for Continual, I'll go out and I'll record myself on Zoom while I'm going through a, a list of sites that I've pre-selected on Google Earth that are sites that are used in my books. And I'll narrate that tour on Google Earth as I take people around to places that I've introduced in the books and used real places in a fictional way and say, hey, have you ever wondered what this looked like? Well, here we are, standing out in front of it, and I'll talk to them a little bit about the history of the place or how it got used in the book, and then I'll record that, put a little nice graphic from Canva at the beginning, put it all together in iMovie, put it up on YouTube, and now you've got that tour to share across all your social media platforms, and it's just a little, little something different. So don't be afraid to mash the different things together with your favorite tools and find out how you can make it even more powerful. Now, I want to open this up for questions. We've got a lot of people up here who do all kinds of cool stuff. So who's got questions? And yes, this track even has a microphone. So please, queue up at the <laughs> microphone so we can all hear you. OK, uh, MD Cooper mentioned that she started in Twitter earlier on. Uh, as far as new platforms, uh, should we be looking at those two? MeWe, Vero, Mastodon, and things like that. Uh, there's so many of them, and it's really hard to predict which one is going to take off. Where's your audience? Mm -hmm. So, for example, on TikTok, I'm largely pushing my male male romance because I know male male romance readers are on TikTok. Not so much with my, you know, classic epic fantasy sword and sorcery. They're not so much hanging out on TikTok. So, where are your, where are, where's your audience? And the one thing I'd add to that is when you're trying to figure out platforms, there is value in being an early adopter, knowing that a lot of the time that that platform is not going to survive and it's going to not be useful. But if you are an early adopter, even if you do nothing more than make sure you've secured your name there on that platform, then at least nobody else can take it and emulate you and you've got it secured in case that platform does become the next platform that blows up. Yeah, I know myself personally, I just kind of go with some of the mainstream ones that I know are successful, they're working, and if some of these other ones rise up in power and prove it to me, I can easily switch over. But what you're saying is correct, you know, but I kind of don't gamble too much. But if you do, it can pay off. I think the other thing to also think about is how much time do you have? How many yeah, platforms exactly, can you do exactly. a good job on? Because if you never show up there or you show up once every three months because you're on you're trying to do too many places it's not going to be effective for you anyhow so what's your time budget for your social media efforts uh, i have a buddy that i play with on other um, social media when they start coming out so like we've been playing on be real right now 
to see if AI like it, what's going on, who's there. And so that's kind of my thing. I'll, if one's starting to take off, I'll go stick my toe in with my friend and we'll play with it and see if we like it. And like with Be Real, after like a week, we were like, oh. <laughs> we're like no. Even if it came off, I don't, took off, I don't think I could do it. I think something that can be useful is to use like the status of website. Status keeps a list of the most popular um, social media platforms. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, like if you look at stuff like Twitter and Reddit are down at the bottom of the top 17. Um, the, what is it now, like number 10 is QQ and then Cena and then Kuashu. So, so there, I mean, depending on who you want to hit with your content, there actually are some platforms out there that, that are almost as big as TikTok that almost nobody knows about, but you might be able to reach some interesting people on them. I actually do use some of the various platforms from China because I think they're kind of fun to engage on. I do a lot of like heavy translating, but they're, it's, it's neat to see how people are using social media elsewhere. So it's, I definitely, I like to experiment and explore too, but you gotta definitely have to know when to cut your losses. Mm -hmm. you know? And if you don't enjoy it, I think that's. Yeah, that's the main thing still always yeah. is do you enjoy it? Mm -hmm. Great question. Yeah. Hey, okay, so great information around the technical aspects and business aspects. I'd like to hear opinions on mental health and social media because uh -huh. we're seeing a, book talk is great, but book talk it can also be like a rabbit hole of very to like toxic, toxic shit. So just I am a, I, I'm that. a huge believer in block and delete. I don't engage. If you're an a-hole out there, I block and delete. I can't argue someone out of being an a-hole, but I can remove them from my life much easier than in real life. So you get one shot. You piss me off, I block and delete, and I have a good rest of my day. In fact, I can, it's kind of cathartic, you know, because the guy who took my parking spot, I couldn't block and delete him well without getting in a whole lot of trouble. I guess I could, but it's so hard to hide a body. Um, but you know, I can just hit those buttons. I actually teach a workshop called Keeping Sane, because I teach people how to do digital media for their life, for their career. And I'm sending them out to the wolves basically. So I spend a lot of time talking about limiting your time on social media, knowing when to take a break. Because even if you're blocking the a-hole, mm -hmm. it still can be a very toxic environment. Like one of the reasons why I still don't trip over to Twitter is because my feed's not curated enough for me not to want to kill somebody every three minutes. <laughs> so you have to kind of pick your battles. And I always tell people if the feed's getting you down, go and do the creative stuff. Um, Pinterest is a nice place where usually there's not a lot of crap going on. Some t most of the time on Instagram. So when you're starting to feel like I've had enough of the trolls and all the bad stuff, pick those platforms, but you have to take the step away. I mean, it's the hardest mm -hmm. thing to do if that's how you're connecting with your audience, but you have to take that step away, so. It, and for me, it's all about why am I on the platform? You know, it's having intention. Why am I there? What am I doing? And is what I'm doing feeding to why I'm intending to be there? Because again, there's a very big difference between I'm on this platform to share life and stuff with friends and family and people that I know well versus a lot of people in a large audience that I don't. Um, and so I use uh, part of the reason I use some of the scheduling tools and stuff I do is because it's an insulator um, to let me go out and do stuff. And that way I could just go out if I need to react and interact with people and whatnot. I go out, I, I spend a few minutes a day. It looks like I am on social media much more than I actually am. Um, and again, you know, I, because I do a lot of it, you, you create the experience. And I think the other thing to remember is the things you interact with, tolerate on social media, also translate into the things that you're gonna get fed more of. I yes. Was, yes, so I'll make it real quick. We're all living in a Wi-Fi suit. We're walking around it. We're breathing it. I have three children. My oldest will be 11 later this year. And, you know, they have Kindles. They're on social media. I don't block things because they're going to find out about everything eventually anyway. And I monitor. I watch them. They're on it a lot. But I remember when I was a kid, I was on my Atari 24-7. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay I turned out all right but my kids are growing up in a different world you know so I think they're gonna be that that generation to see psychologically what happens but so far so good yeah I think what Tyra said about curating your feed is also really important because 
Um, I'm out there to talk with other people about the things I love, like books and Supernatural. And so if somebody is a troublemaker, I'm going to get rid of them. If somebody is pushing politics, I'm going to get rid of them. That's not what I'm out there for. I don't want to engage with it. And I don't want to see it and have it ruin my day. Yeah. So um, I am cherry picking who I see because this is my time and my feed and I need to control that for my mental health. I, I also think that most people that are trying to build a social media presence are posting too much. Um, people seem to think you need to post every day multiple times a day. I, I've actually been doing a bunch of experimenting with this and I think that if you do that you actually screw the pooch because um, like Jim was saying, they actually, every, on every social media platform, they test your content with a small group of people. If they respond well, they test with a large group of people, larger and larger and larger. Even when you write a new book or, or have a new release and Amazon does an email about your new release, they do the same thing. They're sending out to a small group. If they buy, they send it to more. If they don't buy, they stop sending out the email about you. Um, everything does that. And if you, if you are basically spamming mediocre content, um, onto social media, you're going to spam yourself into oblivion. So, so post a couple times a week. Like, don't go crazy with it. I've, I've built, like I said, like um, my my blueberry sage across all social media is probably in the next month or so is going to hit a hundred thousand people. And I post maybe once a week. Sometimes I go weeks without posting. And when I do, I get massive engagement when I come back. Um, I also really believe quite strongly in the eighty twenty rule. Twenty percent of your efforts are bringing eighty percent of your of your results. Find out what those twenty things twenty percent is, and stop doing the other eighty mm percent. -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so, kind of going along with the mental health thing, um, I guess. So, a lot of these platforms really push, you know, engagement and consistency and all of that. So, I was just wondering, how do you all handle like creator burnout? Like, Tyra, you're saying like you turn towards the creative stuff, but like, what happens when even that becomes like a little too much or you get overwhelmed? I spent two years there. So like the pandemic when everybody was like being super creative, I was super not. Um, I had so much anxiety and I just so much, I just couldn't create at all. And so what finally got me back into that space was being around people who were having the same sort of situations, which you can find on social media. And I found a lot of creators that were inspiring. And finally, I just ended up in the right workshop online through a zoom thing and uh, my creativity came back but i think again it's reaching out to others is the key i think that's also the key with mental health is not letting yourself close yourself off and so for me that's what worked i found other people and so now i'm back to podcasting and writing I great would, i was going to say for me a lot of it boils down to i like real interaction it's part of the reason i do a lot of conventions it drives me, it feeds that, it curates that. That's part of the reason when we created Continual, it was because everything got locked down. And even if you're introverted, I am shy and quiet, by the way. Um, even if you're introverted, having the ability to do real interaction over, you know, buy my stuff, buy my stuff, buy my stuff, or whatever the case, but burnout will happen, which means sometimes you just go and say, and delete. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Great question. Yeah. Hi. So I'm not even sure if this is something you guys will be able to answer, but I've heard um, quite a few of the people that I follow talking about um, the algorithm, specifically on TikTok, but also in regards to Instagram, where they've got a lot of viewers and everything's going really well and a lot of people are following them. And then all of a sudden it just drops and the algorithm is no longer pushing their videos and they lose a lot of attention. So I was just wondering if this is something you've experienced and if so, you know, how did you work around it or is there a way to avoid it in the first place? <laughs> Okay. Um, so I, um, I've been full on banned on TikTok twice with my account completely removed and had to like beg to get it back. I've, um, I've actually been banned on YouTube multiple times. What are you um, doing, sister? Wearing latex in a gas He's planting mask. potatoes. Yeah, they think it's kinky even though I'm gardening. It's like, okay, your kink is weird, but... Um, so anyway, and I've been shadow banned on TikTok three times, and I've been shadow banned on every other platform as well. And shadow banned is probably what, is what, kind of what you're describing, where suddenly no one is seeing your content. Um, you're putting out the same content, you're following the same kind of structure you were before, and no one's seeing it. And what that means is you probably got reported a whole bunch. Um, and they've shadow banned you as a result, and you just have to wait. Um, you know, I, I usually decrease the amount of content I put out on a platform while I'm shadow banned, because chances are no one's ever going to see it anyway. Um, and usually, I think TikTok's about three weeks, you usually end up being shadow banned for, although they can change that at any time. 
Um, and sometimes it could be, usually the other thing that can have cause it to happen is you use the wrong hashtag. Um, so my persona that I'm doing, you know, she's a post-apocalyptic gardener, right? So I figured like, hey, I'm just gonna tag prep talk um, for the preppers. <laughs> and I wasn't thinking straight, because prep talk is full of a lot of fundamentalists and they were not keen on me. And that's what caused one of my bans. Because I just used, I used the wrong hashtag and I put my content in front of people that pissed, it, pissed off. And they reported the hell out of me. And I, I lost my account as a result of actually that time. So yeah, it's, it really is be careful who you put your content in front of. Because you're gonna piss someone off no matter what you make, you know. I never thought of checking hashtags, so now yeah, it's a new thing to be paranoid okay, about. Yeah, yeah. That does not mean what you think it means. <laughs> That's frequently true. Yeah, and I mean, the, the other thing you're going to discover is this. If you're at, at some point, somebody's not going to like you or something you say. And uh, we were talking here and here yesterday on free speech. I am absolutely a free speech advocate, which means I can say anything within within what's legal However, no one is obligated to listen to it. The problem we do now have is instead of blocking you and saying, yeah, I don't want to hear from you, we go and say, I don't want anyone to see or hear that because I don't agree. Well, the problem is when you do that, you then create either an echo chamber or you wind up shutting down voices. And when you shove things underground, bad things happen. Um, so it, it, these platforms are designed and I think it's worthwhile to remember um, this. I'm going to be a Captain Buzzkill for a minute. Social media platforms exist as businesses because they are doing things to gather data on you so that they know how to market to other people. The fact that there's incidental contact because it provides value because you get to interact with people is almost ancillary. So one of the things that you sometimes have to do is these platforms are pay to play. If you are make if you're making headway and all of a sudden it goes off a cliff, that may be that subtle knot. Also, you need to spend a little money with them, yeah, to get you back into play. I think the, the, along with that, the old saying is, if you're not paying for a product, you are the product. Mm -hmm. and that's that's sort of how it works. But I, I I'll say like use the platform and don't be used by the platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, social media is a parasite. It happens to okay. feel good when they eat you, but they're really the parasite. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think the other thing to keep in mind, and this particularly happens on Facebook, but it happens on the others as well, is they're using a lot of automated bots to scan for content. And some of the most stupid stuff will trigger a bot. And sometimes they'll trigger a bot from three years ago on posts that, you know, I know people who have gotten bots triggered on their... They, had a picture of a flower and it somehow went against community standards um, and every time that happens argue it because if you argue it you might not win but odds are it'll go in front of an actual human being who will look at it and go oh that's a book cover and your odds are much better never never just roll over and take it well folks we are at the end of our time so uh, a reminder to please rate our panel on the dragon con app a reminder please to donate and a lightning round here to let everybody tell you where you can find us the rest of the con starting down there um so you can i only have one more no i have two more i'm going to be doing um the good the bad and the map tonight at seven o'clock and then tomorrow i'm doing something called beyond terra which is about exploration and expansion what, what will happen in the future at 10 o'clock over um, in Hilton as well. And if you want to reach out to me, you can find me um, by looking for MD Cooper on pretty much every platform. And if you want to find my alternate persona, you can just search for Blueberry Sage on pretty much every platform. She was easy to find. Um, I'm Tyra Burton. You can find me online at tyraburton.com. You can find links to my podcast there. Tonight, I'm going to be talking about building online communities down in the digital media track at 8.30. And tomorrow at 10 a.m., where I will not be awake, I will be at the writer's track talking social media and me, a love-hate relationship. And I have a feeling you're on it. No, I'm not. You're not? Okay, well, I'll be the love side of that one. So I'm so. not entirely grumpy. And gr okay, oh, never mind. Yeah. Come on, <laughs> Uh, you you can find me just I uh, just Google search my name Troy Face and it'll go right to Amazon where all my books are from there you know all the platforms I'm on so uh, I run into people all the time you know people contact me buy my stuff how can I find out it's real simple you Google search my name it all pops up so there you go 
including the picture from the post office. Oh, wait. Some of that. <laughs> no, I deleted that. Oh, okay. Um, I am going to be doing, so some of y'all may want to come see this. It's 7 o'clock tonight. I'll be back in here to talk about GDPR in 2022. Um, then 8.30, I will be talking about The Witcher Season 2. Oh. And then tomorrow at 1 o'clock, I will be talking about intellectual property and how that affects creatives and authors and all that kind of good stuff. Um, you can find me at jamespnettles.com. Um, that'll link you to all the kind of different stuff I'm in. And we've got some swag up here for continual as well. I'm pretty easy to find at galesymartin.com, morganbrice.com. I've got two more panels tonight on Victorian spiritualism and um, supernatural. And then I'm on a couple of panels tomorrow. And uh, so look me up in the app. And yes, please come up and get swag. Thank you for being a wonderful audience. Thanks for our wonderful panelists and our great crackheads.